Yeah, so it was one supercell, which, which supercells is the name of these rotating long-lived storms. And this breed of storms is responsible for the majority of the world's strong tornadoes. And this breed of storm called a supercell happens in the United States like no other place in the world. That's actually what my video is about is, is why more tornadoes happen in the United States than anywhere else. So that's, you're, you're right on topic for me. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Ultimately it's our unique geography yeah. that sets the stage for these supercells that assemble all the ingredients for tornadoes to occur. Growing up in Texas, tornadoes were just a part of life. I talked about this in a recent YouTube video. Tornadoes, hail, massive thunderstorms, they were scary. They could mess up your life. Like, how many times were we in the middle of a TV show when the weatherman breaks in with an extreme weather alert and breathlessly points at small towns on a map just one county over that were currently getting hammered by God himself? We'd gather around the TV, flashlights in hand, hanging on his every word, every new nugget of info going into our mental calculation of when exactly we needed to go down into the cellar. And then, off in the distance, the siren. Nothing strikes fear into the heart of an eight-year-old boy more than the dreaded tornado siren. In our case, it meant running in the rain two houses over over to my aunt's house where uh, we go down in their cellar because we didn't have one ourselves. And their cellar was always just a little bit flooded. So you had to like walk across bricks that were barely clearing the water. And of course the mildew and, and mustiness smell was just overpowering. And then one person would stay above ground with a radio, just kind of waiting for the all clear. Or if things got bad enough to jump in and close the door behind them at the last minute. They were the brave ones. And then there were the crazy ones. There was one in my family. While we rushed down to the cellar, he put on a rain jacket and ran out to his truck, the one with the giant CB radio antenna in the back. He was a storm chaser or tornado spotter. He drove around with a handful of other spotters looking for tornadoes and communicating between them on the CBs to kind of triangulate the location. And if they confirmed a tornado on the ground, they would call the news station. And that's how the info made its way to other flashlight wielding families and other living rooms. So yeah, in the days before instant satellite imagery, this is how it was done by crazy people willing to put their own lives in danger to keep their neighbors safe. Pecos Hank is one of those crazy people. I ran across his YouTube channel a while back. I can't even tell you how. It might have been just an algorithm thing. But his channel features tornado footage that he's covered from his years chasing storms. And, and I just immediately thought it was awesome. I mean, first of all, the, the tornado footage is amazing. That's reason enough. But second, he kind of explains what you're looking at in a sort of a story fashion. So you're pulled into his experience and you learn something. And third, he's, he's just, he's a good dude with a, with a gentle soul who'll stop what he's doing in the middle of following a storm just to escort a snake off the road so it doesn't get run over. Anyway, he quickly went on the list of creators I wanted to meet through this podcast, so I was thrilled that when I reached out to him, he was willing to come on. It also just happened to coincide with a video on tornadoes that I was doing, so I got to ask him about the science behind them, hear some of his crazier experiences that he's had chasing down these monster tornadoes, and also just, you know, talked about science and art and YouTube. It was a good time. So with that, I will stop talking. Let's jump into our conversation with Pecos Hank. I came across your channel, I think, um, maybe a little over a year ago, I was researching ball lightning. And, you know, some storm stuff came up and, and your videos were included in that. And, and uh, I don't know how much of it was that just the YouTube algorithm was like, hey, you watch this guy's video. I'm going to show you all his stuff now. And it just kind of kept coming up. Uh, and how much of it was just that I was like, I really like this guy, but I, I just started watching you then. And I was like, I, I want to talk to this guy. He does some really interesting stuff and you have a great personality and um, uh, great, great, great voice that you, that you use to great effect in your, in your voiceovers. Um, but uh, no, I just kind of wanted to, to see what, yeah. <laughs> well, dude, first so, off, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course. Um, so is this a full-time thing? The, the tornado chasing and uh, the content creation from it? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I'm like most creators, probably like you too, is you as well, not the band you too. Um, <laughs> I'm doing, I mean, I'm also a musician, so I play music. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I'm really into investing right now oh, okay. and, and, and all of that. So, so you're just doing multiple things at one time. So some people don't even know that I do this. Like most of the people in Houston have no idea. Wow, like really? they, that come to my shows in Texas. They just think I'm that guy from that band that's been around forever. <laughs> and what is the band? Uh, it was Pecos Hank now. Oh, okay. And, and so it's just Pecos Hank, but it used to be a band called Southern Backtones, which sounds like Southern rock, but it was more like indie, indie rock. Think of David Bowie mixed with Elvis. <laughs> David Bowie with a little Southern charm. With uh, well, with the the anglo the anglophile the the Brit pop. Oh, okay. Cool. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of YouTubers that cover various things um, that started off as musicians and still do music, but kind of somehow went the the YouTube direction. There's there's a good buddy of mine, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. He's he's a rocket expert now uh but he got started as a musician and a photographer and he would like make youtube videos about rockets and put his music in there and the next thing you know he just nerded out so hard on rockets he became a, a rocket expert and um there's a guy that does a channel called cold fusion uh Degogo is his name but he's a dj and makes electronic music and puts his own music in his videos and stuff i, I don't know it's just it's it's interesting to me that i run into so many musicians that that go the youtube route not even to promote Maybe. their music it's like on totally different things but um sorry you started to say something yeah maybe we're just generally art artists who most artists i know like to do a little bit of everything yeah and it's extremely difficult to make a name for yourself just playing live music all the time and youtube really you know popped up in our generation Mm -hmm. and and really it's, it's just substantially easier and so that's just kind of the ticket you know most of us probably spread our fingers everywhere and that's the one that's catching on right now how about you Did you were you a musician you were an actor or are an actor uh once upon a time i could call myself a musician i would never call myself that now i've got a i think i'm sitting in front of it there's a guitar behind me over here but i i know maybe five chords uh <laughs> that's that's all there is you only need three i can play all the hootie catalog so i'm good for that um no I, you know I, when i was a kid i played piano i played violin at one point uh trumpet in high school band kind of thing um i dabble on guitar i suppose but um uh, uh it's actually it's one of these things that like if i if i met my 18 year old self he would probably be massively disappointed because back then i was like really into music and um, that was one of the reasons I went to the University of North Texas, because they have such a big music school up there. Um, and then I got there and realized I was just totally out of my league. And so I kind of fell back on my my second favorite thing when I was young anyway, was uh, screenwriting and filmmaking. So I was doing the filmmaker thing. And then I wound up kind of working uh, in advertising, which is good steady paycheck and all, but uh, not really sometimes creatively fulfilling, but usually not. Um, but uh, better than some other jobs. Yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're a creative person, definitely. Yeah. Um, in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, I made uh, a feature film, did the festival rounds with that, got some screenwriting work out of that. I'm, I'm kind of giving you my whole life story now. Uh, <laughs> but um, I made some YouTube videos to sort of promote the movie. And to this day, if you go back to the beginning of my channel, those are what the first videos were, was sort of promoting this movie. Same here. And it just it just scratched all the itches. So I just kind of kept doing it. And it just kind of became this science communication channel sort of on accident. And uh, yeah, here we Same are. here. We have a very similar story. I, my the, the name of my, if you look at the URL, I think it might be Honky Tonk Blood. <laughs> which is a, which is which is a name we made or at least and so that's this channel started off promoting that movie uh -huh. you know with this this horrible indie film that we made you know and, oh, it was a uh, movie called honky tonk blood we made a full length movie Fun. kind of about the houston music scene uh -huh. and we all start in it and there's if there's literally there's very little acting it's literally live cameras and we weaved that into a murder thriller uh, and uh, but anyway, that's what that was all about. And I wanted to hide my fascination with science and tornadoes. Like I felt like 
you're not allowed to, they're not allowed to know you do two things because then they, they won't think you're committed. Mm -hmm. You know, what if, what Mm -hmm. if you found out that Jim Morrison really spent his time collecting seashells, (laughs) you know, it might Mm -hmm. break your heart. I don't know. I would think it would be cool, but the average person might have their heart broken and uh, you know, that, that he's a nerdy dude. And so I tried to hide hide all that. But then of course the tornadoes that I was getting back then I would pop on and those would just get so much more exposure. And so then I started putting my music underneath them Mm -hmm. and started selling more records. I sell more records now of the records that I made back in 2000. Uh I sell more of those records now than I did, you know, when that, those CDs first came out. I was wondering if that was a, a good vehicle for actual music sales. No, but it's better than going out and playing live. <laughs> it's fair enough. It's actually pretty good. I mean, you know how it is. It's it's when you have an audience like we're fortunate to have, you get these micro royalties streaming in from as many different streams as you can, and it starts to add up and enables you to keep doing what we love, which is what yeah. we're doing. Well, you have some videos. 23 million views, the top 10 best tornadoes, 23 million views. That's insane yeah that's nuts the 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 highest viewed video i have is like 4.5 maybe 4.7 million and that's, that's like nuts. twice as much as the that's, the second one yeah. um yeah i guess people like like their tornadoes yeah um yeah thankfully <laughs> thankfully they're all sadists like i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> It's yeah, there's this fascination with mother nature and there's this fear. It's, it's a little bit of everything that, that brings people in. Mm-hmm. Well, what about you? Like, how, is that, is that what brought you in? Did you have an experience when you were a kid that made you fascinated with tornadoes or anything? Yes. And no, um, I had the experience that awoken it. I mean, it was always there. It was like one of those Sam Harris genetics videos that we can go down, you know, and, and it was there. And of course, I think most people have that. I think they, you know, why? snakes tornadoes and dark music why you know since and a lot of my friends you could see the things that they liked when they were eight they kind of followed that path and so Mm -hmm. i think it's the the nature part and uh but yeah a few things happened that basically you just were exposed to some amazing storms and you thought i want that did you grow up in texas yeah dallas dallas and houston going back and forth okay um, I think there was something about being in Texas because you that is a reality you deal with on, on a pretty regular basis. Um, I mean, I definitely saw a, t- a couple of tornadoes when I was a kid, um, kind of off in the distance. I wasn't tornado chasing or anything, but, uh, you know, you do tornado drills in school. And um, my, my aunt lived two doors down. She actually had a, a storm cellar. We didn't. Um, but, you know, it was it was funny because like, when, it, when a storm hit and the tornado siren went off, which that's something I think every Texan understands, the sound of that tornado siren, um, we would run over to my aunt's house. Sometimes it was raining, sometimes it wasn't, but we'd go down in the cellar and, um, and my aunt's a fairly, you know, um, humorous, funny lady anyway, but I don't know, it was, it was a pleasant experience to me. You know, we go down there and, and I think probably because of nerves, people would make jokes and tell stories and stuff. And it was just like this, and you're like in this little hidey hole, you know, and as a kid, it's just fun. Um, so I had this almost weird positive experience with tornadoes when I was a kid. But I can relate to that in Dallas. I remember the tornado drills in the school. So mm-hmm. you would all go, okay, we're having a tornado drill. And you're like, yeah, I get Put the to book get over your class. Head. We did, uh, we went on hall. We went in the hall and, and just put our hands over our head in the corners, which is not uh, a very good system considering where <laughs> Dallas is at the yeah. time. So yeah, that would have been in, where was that? Euless, Euless, mm-hmm. Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then I remember we lived kind of on a hill, you know, that's Dallas can be a little, a lot more hilly relative to Houston and there would be tornado watches. Yeah. And I thought, Oh good. Let's go watch the tornado. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if there's a, you know, if there's a, a zebra watch at the zoo, you get to see zebras, right? Let's go watch the zebras. And so there's a tornado watch. Let's go watch the tornado. I mean, I would sit every tornado watch and you could see the storm uh-huh. and, and never saw, never saw a twister or anything like that. And it just, 
I wanted to see one so bad it's as long as I can remember. I don't know why. You said something a minute ago about um, being awoken by by something at one point. Was was there a specific event that kind of turned things? Well, that was one. Obviously, I mean, even every a lot of people cite the Wizard of Oz because it was just such a real and eerie. Even that sepia. I mean, even when in real life, a lot of times everything goes sepia, you know, during a tornado. So that really captured something awesomely scary and then but the big one i suppose also when i was a kid we were driving in minnesota my 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 grandparents are from minnesota and in the flats around minneapolis i suppose or it could have been duluth i don't remember exactly but uh all of a sudden on a road that i knew was flat there was a mountain this is from the perspective of a four or five year old kid Mm -hmm. there was a mountain and i thought where the hell did that mountain come from and so I asked my mom, what is that? And she turned around and looked at me in the back seat and she said, it's hell. Right. I know what you're thinking. Right. <laughs> Freak, freaky ass mom. So later on, I realized she said, hell. <laughs> but I'd never heard that word before, sure, but yeah. I had, I had heard hell. And so I'm thinking, why the hell are we driving towards hell? Uh-huh. It's a bad place, right? <laughs> and and she just seemed to you know be tootling along in the front seat. I remember in the back, it was her and my grandmother. And so then fast forward, I don't know, a month, a year, two years later. Do you remember the movie Fantasia? Oh, yeah. Okay. And then there's a scene where the mountain opens its wings and it's the devil. It's the devil, yeah. And I, I went, that's what I saw. In your and mind as a kid. In my yeah. mind, I've seen the devil, you know, and, and that just that infected imprinted on me you know and and i just lied awake at night pondering what all the existentialism that means uh-huh. of course i don't believe any of that bullshit now but <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, most, most texas like five-year-olds believe in all that yeah yeah wow so you were scarred for life and then um <laughs> no i was imprinted on Okay. Like it it was like a fascination was, was put there. Fascinated me to all ends. So when did you start actually doing tornado, uh, like storm chasing and stuff? The day after I saw that, that hail hill. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but every storm I was out watching every Uh, single one of them. I was out. I mean, I remember even when we had cassette recorders, I would just record thunder. And when, when I got my first car, you know, trying to capture lightning, you know, and, and got actually got a, a, a photo of lightning after it struck, it was a multi-stroke and was actually able to get the channel on mm-hmm. print, you know, as a kid. And then, uh, and then when I got a car, when I was 16, started driving to the edge of the subdivision into the farm fields for better views. And we just watched them come in. And then, of course, you get lured further and further and further each year until now I'm going to Australia, and yeah. you know, Thailand and everywhere to, to get these storms. Wow. So that just became a whole thing. Yeah, I guess I did go a little overboard. <laughs> it's everything to me now. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because like in my mind, I'm trying to like pinpoint the exact moment, but there was no moment. It was just like always there. For me? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were going to say something about something that you do and something that you love and where it came from it. and where it's part. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm not people, that passionate about anything. Oh, whatever. Yeah, you can't be as successful as you and not have a passion. <laughs> Perhaps, maybe you can. the OCD. Well, so um, did you get any formal education on like uh, meteorology or anything like that? No. I was studying biology at U of H. Uh, I went to U of H for seven years and still didn't get my bachelor's degree. <laughs> What's the line biology. from Tommy Boy? A lot of guys go to school for seven years. Yeah, they're called doctors. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, I was that guy, not the doctor. And uh, <laughs> then, then my band became really successful and we were uh-huh. touring in limousines. And of course, I was like, I don't need school audios books this, this is gonna last forever right right and, and i loved i loved I, I hated you know grade school but i really loved college and university and uh, uh but yeah of course once you're in a limousine and you're you know <laughs> touring around in that it's it's uh, uh 
and you've got it all worked out in your early 20s yeah yeah late later 20s yeah 25 26 27 something like that okay a little bit of time to remember remember i'd been in school for seven years (laughs) yeah and i took a year off and moved to la to be a rock star but ended up just delivering pizza instead Mm. and uh came home after a year and went to school so yeah eight years after 18 so 26 but were you delivering pizzas from a limo no <laughs> from a from a 1968 Mustang. Hey, that's cool. Oh, yeah. Assuming you're surf, not constantly surf, breaking down. Yeah, I was constantly breaking down. But back then, you could you could you can fix a 68 Mustang yeah. with just the stuff lying on the road. You know, here's a piece <laughs> of wire. Here's a duct tape. Uh, I wanted to ask about like the the storm chasing that you do and stuff. And obviously, I I could get into like what's the craziest experience you ever had and that kind of thing. We we could do that, but. Um, I guess, I guess the first question I have is, can you even get your car insured? Do yeah. You just have a, do I, you have a windshield person on standby. I don't destroy cars. I get, I, I mean, I've had this current car. It's other people destroying my last car. Some crackhead smashed into me in the middle of nowhere. Oh yeah. And that that's what, that's the most dangerous thing about storm chasing. Mm. Uh, but this car I've had for what, four years now. And it just has a few hell dents. I, and I don't claim them. So, mm. you know, we wear our hail dents as badges of honor. Sure. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't destroy cars. There was a time when I was a young punk, I would have thought it was cool to destroy a rental car. But now I, I can calculate and quantify the environmental waste of such a thing. Mm. And, uh, and, and so when, it's not cool to me anymore. But I imagine there has to be some level of experience to know uh where to be to avoid the hail and, and avoid getting into trouble and stuff busted, busted you got what? me busted you, you, you got yeah there's the along the experience way yeah <laughs> it wasn't oh, okay. the same as i feel now yeah so at first <laughs> i you know i didn't mind taking the the rental cars into hail storms and we'd giggle if we bottomed out and sparks flew everywhere and, uh, and uh, yeah so but eventually you kind of can it's like i guess a sport free diving or snow skiing you learn how to relax and do it and mm-hmm. conserve energy mm-hmm. and 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 yeah so there's very little scatter but like at first if you if you followed my slug trail on a map it would just be squiggles everywhere now it's like just drive straight to where the tornado happens a couple of squiggles and then come home uh-huh. but 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 you've been doing it long enough to know I guess I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is is like uh, when I think tornado chaser, I think that that is a very scary, dangerous job. But you make it sound like it's more like you know exactly where to go, exactly where not to go, so that you're minimizing the risk involved in it. That's the idea. Um, thank you. Uh, but there's still <laughs> those those. That's what. Well, I, I figured out that if I can not get too impulsive and greedy, then I may live to see another 10 years of tornadoes. Like mm-hmm. why go all in? Even when you're playing poker, why go all in? You can go half in and still scare the guy away. And then you've got a second chance in case yeah. you do lose to play, to live to fight another day. So that's kind of my logic behind that. And, and, uh, I do have the impulse to, uh, get closer sometimes, um, it's it, you do. There is the uh, bug to the light thing out there. Yeah, you know, yeah. you you just want to get in there and see it out of out of just pure curiosity and fascination. Yeah. Some some people do it. Probably both. I think the people that go and get really close to the tornadoes are doing it for both. It's not just for the shock craziness mm-hmm. for YouTube, but also I think these guys really do love tornadoes as well. Hey, has all this tornado talk got your head spinning? <laughs> See what I did there? Head spinning. I'm such a card. Well, if so, why not keep that spinning spinning over at Curiosity Stream with their amazing series, Fatal Forecast. This is a series that looks at some of the deadliest weather phenomena this angry planet throws at us from heat waves, floods, droughts, polar vortexes, and yes, tornadoes. The very first episode is on tornadoes, actually, and they cover how they form and and why they form in some areas more than others uh, through exclusive interviews with storm chasers, meteorologists, and climate scientists. 
It's like, if you like my little 20 minute video that I shot here in my house, uh, this is an hour long deep dive featuring some of the most amazing tornado footage ever recorded. I think you'll really like it. And I know you may be thinking, wow, Joe, how did you come up with a curiosity stream show that happens to be on the very topic you're covering here? Well, here's the thing. Uh, no matter what I'm talking about, there's a curiosity stream video on that subject because curiosity stream is the premier streaming service for documentaries and educational content in the world with compelling programs from some of the best documentary filmmakers around the world all in one place. It's your go-to place to nerd out on pretty much any topic that crosses your mind. But here's the thing. When you sign up with Curiosity Stream, you also get Nebula, which is yet another amazing streaming platform made by YouTube creators like myself for fans of educational YouTube content. Like myself. It's where you can watch our videos totally ad-free, and it's also where you can see exclusive series that we can't monetize on YouTube. It's kind of our little place to experiment and do cool stuff without having to be beholden to an algorithm. Like my original series, Mysteries of the Human Body, where I talk about this weird meat puppet you're operating right now, unexplained diseases and plagues throughout history, human oddities, and the mystery of why we age and die. And you can get both of these amazing platforms for only $14.79. That's not $14.79 a month. That's for an entire year. For two streaming services. It's bonkers. So, yeah, to get all that, just go to curiositystream.com slash joescottpod. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash joescottpod, and you can be rolling in that sweet, sweet, nerdy goodness right away. So one more time, curiositystream.com slash joescottpod. Go check it out, and thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this podcast. Now back to Hank. <laughs> it almost sounds like the, the call of the void. Sure. Like you, you see this dangerous thing and you're just like drawn to it. Uh, yeah. I saw a video recently about, um, I guess it was about George Mallory, the guy who may have been the first one to, to summit Everest, but died on the, on the trip down. It's, it's debatable anyway. Um, but they were, they were talking about summit fever that um, they kind of become overwhelmed with um, the desire to, keep going even though they know that they can't or it's it's dangerous it's like this psychological thing that happens sort of like paradoxical psychological thing um i don't know sorry i'm kind of going off on a tangent there <laughs> no i love that no i want to do that this is what i want to do let's let's figure this out let's brainstorm <laughs> I, that might not be good for a podcast but it sure is fun for us you know that like i was thinking i was listening to you and i can feel my ego do want to do stuff like that like what's pushing me right is it is it curiosity is it ego and and sometimes i can feel ego like i want to swim free dive deeper i want to swim you, that's it's not a comfortable experience but it's me pushing my body kind of thing not that i'm very good at that but uh that could be something for that i don't know if those guys are trying to, it's like accomplishment mm -hmm. yeah every there's all these different uh incentives to do things for us humans Mine <laughs> is mostly, mine is beauty. I think I'm just, that's what my incentive is. I was actually just about to say, I, I don't, just from watching your videos, you don't seem like an adrenaline junkie so much as a beauty junkie. Yes. Like you're, you're just, it's this beautiful thing and you want to capture it and get, get footage of it. I'm sure there's also a monetary incentive on some level, but I feel like it's more of just a, you just want to catch, capture the most amazing images that you can. Yeah, that's it's, an artist thing right there. Yeah, there was uh, I was doing this way before YouTube. And if yeah. you came to my house, I held you hostage and made you watch the videos, <laughs> you know, so I was getting, you know, like two views a week, you know, which is pretty uh -huh. awesome. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, then YouTube pops up and says, hey, you can share them here. Whoa. Uh -huh. you know, and then, you know, a few years later, like, hey, we'll actually give you a little money for your gas and all your efforts. Whoa. Oh, you know, yeah here here now we're gonna pay for your new car what? <laughs> exactly um so what would be the ultimate i don't know video what like um i'm not gonna say something that you would capture and be like all right that's Four it i'm done tornadoes on the ground because i've already seen three at sunset with a double rainbow and ball lightning okay it's, yeah. it's like a leprechaun on a four-leaf clover riding yeah. a unicorn. But this could happen, except for the ball lightning part. I don't believe in ball lightning. So. Well, you know, I was going to ask you about that because I did that video uh, a while back. And um, there's all kinds of stories about like the ball lightning came through the window and swirled around and went up the chimney and all this stuff. That all seems very fantastical and whatnot. But then there right, it's, all, it's more... all anecdotal. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. All anecdotal. Uh, but there were some like theories around what it could be that sounded semi plausible because it was it was like, you know, the the energy levels in lightning is just so strong that it could create like plasma that gets sort of wrapped up in, in like silicates on the ground and stuff. And I'm paraphrasing. agreed. But then that's more that's more causality. Right. That's just kind of a byproduct of a, of a sure CG. Yeah, I remember seeing lightning strike uh, was in Mexico and, you know, it's lightning. I'm throwing up my camera gear as fast as I can from the top of the resort. And just before I hit go, lightning hits the resort next to me and just sparks just you know, fly, <laughs> fly everywhere. And, and uh, in my mind, those balls of, you know, the shrapnel was in the air for two or three seconds. But in reality, it was probably 0.5 seconds. Now, because of the adrenaline and everything, it was, it seemed like yeah. longer. Now, let me, disclaimer, I'm hedging my bets. I hope ball lightning is real. I really do. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to try not to let that bias interfere with, with my theories and my hypothesis. I'm right now speaking to a ball lightning scientist. I mean, a lightning scientist, and uh, he's way more has way more credentials than I do. And, and he believes it. Oh, okay. You know? And so, so we, he now, even the videos he cites, I argue with him. I'm like, that is not all lightning. He's like, I, we don't know what it is. So he, what he does is I think he says we need to have a healthy level. Like it's good to be skeptic. Mm -hmm. It's really great to be skeptic. However, you do need to have a healthy level. You can go overboard with skepticism, which I probably fall on that category. Even the first tornado that I saw, I was looking at it and going, no way. Like that, that's not a tornado. That's just too good to be, mm. to be true. CGI. Right. Yeah. That's just smoke and some other kind of vortex created by maybe, uh, you know, an eddy in the, uh, along the side. Yeah. That's, it can't be a tornado. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Wizard of Oz earlier. I uh, I saw a video that was everything that I I saw a video because apparently I just watch YouTube all day. Um, about, that was explaining how they made that effect in what 1934, whatever that was. Um, and it was literally almost like they had a hula hoop on the bottom, and you know a bigger hoop on the top, and uh, it was just like muslin or whatever kind of fabric that was, and they just kind of like moved it around on the bottom. And it just made this perfect effect. And it like, even today it stands up. Yeah. Holds up. Yeah. The new I, movie that came out 13 seconds, I think nailed the best. They actually use a real tornado. 13 seconds. I've, yeah. I, I think it's called 13, oh, 13 minutes. And minutes. so it's a, it's a, it's, it might be an indie film that came out uh, recently about tornadoes but now now with 4k tornado footage the, the films are so i'm working with uh this director from hollywood that is making a new film uh that's to come out soon and and they're using actual my actual tornado footage so what's going to look more real than actual tornado yeah. footage oh this like just came out yeah and they use a tornado that i saw in in 20 well, what was the tescott tornado 2018 i think and uh, and uh, they really went with realism on, on for their tornado. In other words, it's not the classic high based tube that's well lit that you can see that that the beautiful ones that that I like to say rise up above the white noise of, of the typical tornadoes, which mm -hmm. are nebulous and dark and rainy. And they go with the nebulous, dark, rainy, oh, wide okay. and and really did by far the most realistic tornado that I've seen so far. However, this new movie coming out, Supercell, might outdo them. Okay. Well, well the, the quintessential tornado movie is Twister. <laughs> like, how many myths does that perpetuate? What all did they get wrong in that movie? Everything. Everything? Everything. <laughs> the, only, the only thing that they got that my, people might see is unrealistic is during it like a three or four day tornado outbreak you can go and get tornadoes every single day everything okay. else i got wrong <laughs> does what about this green sky i remember they were looking for a yeah. green sky no they got that right yeah that is right oh, okay i think it's funny that they have you know the bill paxton's team and he's like at one with nature and the earth 
And then there's Carrie Elwood's team. They're like this corporate, you know, bad guys and they've got money because you shouldn't have money. Right. You, know? if you got money. You're bad. Yeah. And they stole his idea for the little things, but then they put the Coke cans on there. And it, yeah, anyway, <laughs> they got, they got Bill Paxton, right? Any movie that put, I love Paxton. So, oh, yeah. you, you know, that, that was a big loss. Why don't you put her in charge? Put her gotta, in charge. <laughs> Game over, man. Just watch that. Um, well, so, okay. Uh, let's get into a little bit of like how tornadoes work. Are you, are you cool with that? Yeah. Tell me how tornadoes work. <laughs> yeah. So there's different kinds of tornadoes that follow different kinds of storms or are, uh, you know, you know, associated with different kinds of storms. And so different, uh, as you know, thunderstorms can be very chaotic. You know, think, you know, like think of just a river and, and if you're along the side of the river where you have all the rocks and things, you get all sorts of just chaotic eddies and, and streams. I mean, it's that times is just a million inside a thunderstorm. And however, there's a certain breed of thunderstorms that we like to say organizes into one cell. And by one cell, we mean one updraft and one downdraft. Um, so sometimes you have cells that are multicellular and that's the most typical kind. And they're, they're they, they kind of just interfere with each other and can kind of create chaos, mm -hmm. but the atmosphere organizes into this one updraft and, and it, the orientation of it will rotate. So, and it will also, let me back up and think of like one of the most common kinds of thunderstorms, which is called a pulse storm. And it's basically just heat rising uh -huh. and then it goes Sorry, up. is that is that the updraft you're talking about the heat rising yeah that's okay. updraft would be so let's think of a thunderstorm as just an updraft which is air moving up mm -hmm. and a downdraft which is air moving down when it's an updraft it, it looks like clouds billowing clouds when it's a downdraft it looks like rain okay so as you're approaching a storm you can if you see the billowy clouds and you can see them kind of rising that's an updraft and then it comes down in the form of rain. What goes up must must come down. And that's so because that as that heat rises, the air cools and condenses, and the water forms and comes back down. Yeah, and then more physics that expands. It releases yeah. heat into yeah, the yeah. atmosphere and all that stuff. So I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible for now. Yeah, it does get um, pretty complex. Yeah, it really does. And uh, so so I think the best way to start out is just do a little little kind of define like a thunderstorm. So you have this rising air. And, uh, and it'll, it'll go up. And once it gets so high, it comes back down, you know, gravity brings it back down. Well, these supercells are kind of like that. So they go up, however, upper level winds are that are stronger as the winds get faster and faster and faster with altitude, it'll actually tilt the updraft. And so when it tilts the updraft, the, uh, it can ventilate. So in other words, the downdraft doesn't just collapse on the updraft and kill mm -hmm. the whole thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. So backing up, most of those pole storms only last 30 or 40 minutes. That's the life expect expectancy of them sometimes, sometimes a little longer. But these supercells, because they're tilted and the rain falls outside the downdraft or the updraft, they can replicate and exist for hours and hours and hours as we just saw on December 10th, when we had what we were calling the quad state storm. Yeah. Yeah. So it was one supercell, which, which supercells is the name of these rotating long lived storms. And this breed of storms is responsible for the majority of the world's strong tornadoes. And this breed of storm called a supercell happens in the United States, like no other place in the world. That's actually what my video is about is, is why more tornadoes happen in the United States than anywhere else. So that's, you're, you're right on topic for me. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Ultimately it's our unique geography yeah. that sets the stage for these supercells that assemble all the ingredients for tornadoes to occur and they happen more often. So that increases the chance is that a tornado will, will occur and they, they, last longer so that increases the chances that a, a tornado will occur okay so, so with so, that i think yeah. that's with that so let's just say we can go deeper and deeper and deeper but just think of a powerful thunderstorm and it's just think of the updraft as just this powerful vacuum just just sucking up everything from the winds 
you know, close to the ground mm -hmm. and event, it starts to rotate. It starts to spin. These storms tend to take all this vorticity, mm -hmm. all this spinning, all these chaotic eddies, and it, it takes them all. And it, it seems like it learns how to, to assemble them and aggregate them. And if the vorticity is all um, cyclonic or spinning the same direction as the earth, that all kind of, uh, like it adds up and grows and grows. It does. And, and that doesn't cancel each other out. It just gets stronger and stronger and stronger until eventually you have a tornado. So in just some quick researching that I was doing for this video, obviously I'm, it's still early right now, but, um, it, it seems like there were two different explanations and, that I ran across. And, and one of them was more just like you have a storm and it turns on like a horizontal axis, axis you know, uh, in, in space like that. And then mm -hmm. another almost made it sound like it's, it's a, almost like the vortex starts sideways. Yeah. Almost at the back of the cloud, it's like, it's like a little steamboat thing in the back, paddle boat. <laughs> and then, and right. then as, that, as that gains momentum, it turns and like hits the ground and becomes vertical. Right. So most of the vorticity that we're talking about is going to be horizontal rolls. So okay. imagine, okay. imagine, imagine that you've got clay and you're, and you're doing this mm -hmm. and you're your hands and it turns into like long noodles. That's what the atmosphere is doing, except for it's not going back and forth. So if you've got, you know, if you've got wind at 20 knots at this level of the sandwich and then, then right above it at 30 knots, it's going faster. Well, the air in between gets rolled into these little vortices. And so that's where it starts off is it starts off horizontal and then the supercells are able to tilt that horizontal into the vertical and, and, and the, that's how the, and, and, and co-locate it with the updraft so that it just kind of amplifies and, and sucks it right up. And it'll, and then there's, there's, I can keep going into stretching <laughs> and stuff like that. There's, there, there's the, um, angular momentum, the conservation of angular momentum, which sounds like a big word, but it's a really simple idea. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, what's the equation? Um, oh gosh, put on the spot. This is so much easier if you're going to do a tornado video to write it down and read it <laughs> because you'll mess it up when you're, at least I yeah. do. Some of the doctors I hang out with can answer. They're prepared. They've got their simple sentences all backlogged on stock, you mm -hmm. know? And so, uh, but uh, you have basically the, the diameter is related to the mass and is related to the speed. So all three of these things are related. And so if you change one, the other changes. And the, the classic uh, example that we use is the ice skater. When her hands are out, her, her radius, her diameter is wider. Okay, so she spins slowly, but her mass is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But when she brings her arms in, her radius gets smaller. And so the, the, the velocity of the vorticity goes up. And so those are, you could stretch it out, you can shrink it, you know, and just go back and forth forever. But the conservation of the angular momentum stays the same. Does that make any sense at all? It does. And in fact, I'm sitting here thinking like, is it, is it the fact that you have this like cyclonic action and as it speeds up, it sort of tightens and that accelerates the speeding up and it, and it yeah. becomes this like tube of right. cyclonic wind? So you've got rotating winds at the surface underneath these supercells, but they might only be 10, 20 knots. It's not strong enough to start lofting debris mm -hmm. or dust and stuff like that. So as it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, it gets faster and faster and faster until all of a sudden the tornado becomes visible. You can have a tornado by definition on the ground that you can't even see. So it could be like a really uh, moist area, like covered with rain. So it's not lofting debris. And, uh, and if you're really close, you can, you can see just right at the surface, these really, you know, buzzing vortices, but you, it, there's no condensation between that and the cloud. Yeah. So it's by def, torn, I mean, air, a tornado is, is a violent column of air and air is usually visible. So you need condensation and you need uh, debris so that you can see the tornado. Yeah. The, the, the older I've gotten and the more I kind of look into all this kind of stuff, it, it strikes me how much uh, the atmosphere is more almost it's, it's fluid. Right. It, it's like an ocean above the ground. Right. It's just a less dense fluid. Yeah. Yeah. That, that shifted my thinking in a, in a lot of ways. Like you were talking about the river earlier with the eddies and stuff like that. Like that's kind of what we're experiencing up here. That helped me out with uh, understanding flight a lot more. 
that I started imagining an airplane taking off, not as something lifting off the ground and into nothing, but as something kind of like gliding through water. Yeah. It's kind of, I don't know, it framed it in a, a different way that made more sense to me. Yeah. And, and if you've, if you've ever flown an airplane, like when you turn, it turns like a boat. So when you, you know, when you turn, uh, it goes straight for a while and then mm. starts to, you know, mm -hmm. of course, uh, depending on how much, maybe, maybe the boats turn faster because of, you know, your fins and your friction in the water, whereas a plane might have less. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, the, con con hello, I almost said the conversation of angular momentum. It's when the angular momentum is having a talk with itself. Sorry. Anyway, conservation of angular momentum. Conservation, right? Conversation. Yeah. Of <laughs> That's what's great about these 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 podcasts and these live talks is is you might have said that and not even known it, then you go back later and you're like, oh, did I really just say that? Yeah. Did I really say that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the the irony is that this this podcast is conversations with Joe is what I call it. So maybe I should call it. Um, conservations with joe I'm there you go gonna stop now um that's the same thing that causes uh solar systems to be on a flat plane that's the same reason that galaxies are in a flat plane is is because of the the angular momentum and everything kind of like sh shrinks down to like a almost a 2d plane Probably. I haven't so, even thought of that. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that's what's so great about these laws of physics is they're universal. Yeah. Literally. Yeah, probably. Isn't that wild to think about? Yes. The same, the same forces that are causing, well, all the planets except for Venus and Uranus uh, are rotating in the same direction. Is, is I like to say Uranus. <laughs> I know. There's no good way to say it because Uranus sounds like urine. I prefer That's what that I think one. of. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just an yeah. ugly word, no matter how it's you do it. It's an ugly word, yeah. And I'm just too immature to, to let it go. I know. I, guess. <laughs> I, I am too. And every single time I mention it, it's like, yeah. Um, there's they they found a ring around Uranus, you know. Yeah, it's I'm sorry, I can't I can't let can't, that yeah. go. I'm I'm too immature. Yeah. The, you, uh, what is it? You can't. You can. You can take the boy out of the. Eh, never mind. I screwed up. We're all thirteen on the inside, is what I guess. Yes, we are. Yeah. yeah, I I still am on the outside. So anyway, back to angular momentum. <laughs> <laughs> what angular momentum? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. We can edit all this out. <laughs> if I edited out all of my bad jokes, there would be nothing left it was no other, podcast just yeah. be other people talking well i wanted to ask you this um one of the things that fascinated me when i was a kid I, of course i loved you know mysteries of the unexplained and that kind of yeah. thing yeah um i loved all those stories for example um it's still there i have not sorry i'm skipping around a bit um there's a ripley's believe it or not museum here in dallas that i went to when i was a kid and it's still there. And I kind of want to go back just to see what's what's there still. But um, I remember in those Ripley's Believe It or Not books, and I want to say it was even at that museum that I went to, crazy tornado stories of like somebody put out something in their mailbox and the tornado swept it away and delivered it right to the house of the person that they were meaning to mail it to. Or things like... Uh, it would drive straws of hay through telephone poles and stuff. Um, those are massive exaggerations, I'm sure. But as somebody who covers a lot of tornadoes and has been there on the ground and seen the results of, uh, you know, the devastation and everything, like, do you have any just things that stand out? It's just like, I cannot believe that happened. First off, when you have winds that are estimated over, you know, up to 200 miles per hour and over, crazy things can happen. You know, yeah. and, and and a grain of straw can have a lot of momentum. Yeah. Granted, there might have already been a crack in the telephone pole that it just kind of, you know, like a whole hay bale got blasted into it. And mm -hmm. that one straw, who knows what what happens? Um, we always as people who are excited and we like to amplify it and exaggerate it to its most extreme possible scenario. Uh, of course. But um, I'm really bad at filming damage and I need to get over this. I think this is something that I wrestle with because I feel so invasive on these poor people. 
that of course I don't. yeah no that's 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 an interesting point yeah but i mean all my friends do it and the people don't seem to mind and and um but i i regret so often not bringing the camera and mm-hmm. and and usually you've got your hands full in that scenario where you're actually holding on to somebody um, trying to help them trying to help them and so i've got no photo damage maybe the the right way to go is to is i've got a drone just to to go in there but even that i feel like i'm i'm going to try to sneak in there and get it when they're not looking and you know maybe i should just go ask them and say hey you know uh this is what i do um but uh yeah i'm so i have not i've got some stories of just crazy stuff where the, the weird thing that I've always seen is I've seen um, subdivisions get wiped out where every other house is is destroyed. But just out of coincidence, nobody was home in this house. And then the people that were home in this house that was cut in half are crawling out. So then you go next door that's completely leveled and you're thinking, oh, God, what am I going to see? I don't want to see this. I don't want to see this. Yeah, but you've yeah. got to help. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and. And then there's nobody there. There's no blood. You're thinking, I don't know if I'm ready to see this. I can remember one, one, this was my first EF5 in 2011 and the house was leveled. I'm deaf in one ear. I'm completely deaf in one ear. So I can't place sounds. And I was walking on this rubble and I hear this child underneath it, you know, and I'm talking to the, you know, whining. And I'm like, Mm. you're going to be okay. I'm here. And I'm just, I'm trying to pull it up and my, you know, I'm grabbing nails and, and, and then this cat walks by. It was just a little kitten meowing, you know, and and Mm -hmm. I don't know why I threw that in, but that's a real thing that I'm just, that's what's going through my mind now is when there's damage, I'm thinking for some reason, I think there could be a child. Like, I don't care about, about adults. (laughs) For some reason, I think (laughs) there could be a child in there and I have to stop, you know, so for me, the chase you know, usually if I notice one, one time I a house got destroyed. I didn't even know it. I, was, I guess I was looking at my gear, you know, and, and then I went back two days later and it's, it's the video where the roof gets lifted off and just lofted. Uh-huh. I had no idea had I known I could have probably made some money off of that video, you know, getting it out as breaking news. But so a lot of times you're also overwhelmed with your gear, with forecasting. Sure. And so, yeah. so you miss a lot of that stuff. Uh, so you said a second ago that, um, you you need to be better i guess about um getting storm damage footage um is is it because it's something that you can use to sort of support yourself by selling to news or something or like what why do you feel bad about that i was just kind of curious out of pure scientific awesomeness okay okay out of pure like i would love to go in and document the 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 all of these things for educational reasons for my own uh, I think the drive is like kind of it. I love having an educational video. That's I just love when I've completed an educational video and and I'm able to teach the world something. And I use, you know, 99% of my own stuff. So, you know, I don't really license other people's stuff very often. Every now and then another storm chaser will have another angle of the tornado. I'm like, hey, dude, let's, let's, you know, scratch each other's back. Sure, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I would love to just go and investigate out of my own curiosities and get those shots of the spoon bent over, you know, through glass and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, you started going down a path that I wasn't even really thinking of. Maybe this says something about me, but but yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess you actually, after you chase these tornadoes and if they hit, you know, uh, populated areas, you're there helping out and and trying to, I mean... That's, that's kind of, that's kind of heavy. (laughs) Yeah. Thank goodness. You'd be surprised how seldom that is. Uh, Yeah. yeah, You know, maybe once every other year that I come Mm. across just the, 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 the EF3, EF4 damage, which is the stuff that destroys houses. EF2 damage, you know, the the structure is generally, unless it's a mobile home, the the structure is generally intact. Mm -hmm. And the people know to at least get away from the windows. And, yeah. but, you know, once you get into the EF4s and the EF5s, it's like, there's sometimes there's no place to even take shelter. Mm-mm. One, one woman that I, that I, a friend of mine, she's a friend of mine now, name's Vicky. And um, she was, I uh, stumbled across her home during an EF4 
and it was a pile of rubble. And I didn't even think to go look for people. It was just, a, I just, I didn't even know it was a house at one point. It was just uh -huh. rubble. So, um, but there was a car that was rolled into the field, you know, maybe a hundred meters away out in this muddy field. And so I thought, uh, I should just, I'm sure there's nobody in it, but, and that might even be bias. You know, I'm, I'm really fascinated with my own bias and the things that I tell myself. Yeah. Uh, so I remember thinking, but we got to make sure. So I ran out in the field to check this truck. Sure enough, there was nobody in it. And as I was walking back, there was this woman just standing up in the rubble. And I thought, oh, somebody else is here because I'm the only one there. You know, I'm, uh -huh. the tornado chasers are generally the first ones on the scene, except for besides the neighbors. And yeah. so I thought, okay, a neighbor's checking. And as I looked closer, she's got just blood, you know, all down the side of her face and, and, and went up to her. And, you know, she had obviously had a concussion. And uh, I ended up driving her to the, uh, to the hospital. And she was cracking jokes the whole time. And we, to this day, we're, we're, we're buddies. We argue uh -huh. politics and, 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 yeah. and have dinner and hug each other at the end. And, and, uh, and I got a good friend out of it. That's nice. I mean, not a good start, but, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I just, I had not even thought about that, that you would run across, uh, some pretty traumatic stuff. I mean, does, yeah, that, does that take its toll sometimes? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, I guess because I don't, I'm not filming. Like mm -hmm. if I was filming, I would make a story. I always regret. I'm like, Oh, you know, this would make such a good story. Um, I think I did one in 2000, like two years ago, I, I came across the same thing for in Mississippi. And I did something that I, maybe I can start doing this where I, I remember once there was nobody there, like once there was, I, just I pulled out my phone and I filmed a clip for three seconds where I panned from the right to the left. And then in post, I was able to pan it to the right and left and then rock it backward. So it, I got six seconds out of it, which was enough mm. to, to uh, tell the story. You know, they did that in Star Wars with the, uh, the sand guy. Did you know that? The, ar, 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 oh, the they end. just reversed it. He just did it once. And they took it and, and rocked it. And, made it go, ah, 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 ah. and if you look at now that you know that when you look at back, you yeah. see that it's just rocking the video back and forth and back and forth. I'm gonna have but to anyway, so I did that. I didn't make that noise, though. I didn't make that. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Didn't turn that into a Tuscan Raider. Yeah, that might have been been inappropriate. But anyways, after so I, I got that the clip of the house, which I'm so glad I did. Uh, and then afterwards, I was walking back and same thing. Zombie man covered in mud and blood, just walking down the mm. road. And, and the, the last thing, the first thing you want to do is you want to go up to him and go, holy shit. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like you look like you're going to die, yeah. you know, but you don't, you go up to him and go, Hey, what's going on? You, you want right? to be calm and not right. freak them out. Yeah. And I always try to have a slight kind of a joke. No big deal. I'm always no big deal. Smart. Yeah. You're like, Hey, you, you all right. You're all right. I'm thinking they're going to, they're just any minute now they're going to throw up on me and go into shock, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I walk up to him and same thing, tough, tough as nails kind of dude. And I said, was, is that your house right there? And he goes, yeah, took me 30 minutes to crawl out of it. And if you saw the video, it's just a pile. And, and then, then you, you, and so then I got in the car, it was the end of the chase. And then I'm, since it's all fresh in my mind, I'm reflecting and telling the story and luckily was able to have some some footage to go back to that one clip, you know, to go mm -hmm. back to, to kind of help tell the story. And then ultimately I think that may put the whole thing in perspective. It might teach people. Somebody might be able to get something out of it of uh, some sort of education, but like you, and I'm assuming this about you, I've only watched two of your videos. <laughs> you seem to recognize the importance of critical thinking and science and you mm -hmm. seem to recognize the lack of that in our world today <laughs> and you and i'm guessing that you you see the the uh positive value of of educating people of how important this tool that we have is to uncovering truths is absolutely and, 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 it, and it feels sometimes like a, an uphill battle um, with all the misinformation and conspiracy stuff that's flying around on the internet and whatnot. Uh, I actually had uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson on here 
Um, Dude, he's like one of my faves. Yeah, I, I was. He, he had a book coming out and I was able to score an interview. It was kind of wild. I was just sitting here with a smile on my face the whole time, just letting him talk, basically. But um, but that was one of the things I was talking to him about was I was like, I mean, he's been doing science communication far longer than I have. I'm just like, what what is it like doing this at a time when it just feels like you're drowning in a sea of misinformation and stuff? And um, what did he say? Well, I think specifically at the time it was the the COVID and the vaccine hesitancy and all that kind of thing. And uh, I remember he, his his response was something like, we haven't run the experiment of what this would be like if we weren't doing what we're doing. So it may be a lot worse if we weren't doing what we're doing. And I was like, okay, that's what I needed to hear. <laughs> you know? I got the same thing from him. Like he approached, like rather than getting angry, which I know when I get angry that that's human nature and I should be able to control that as well because that's mm -hmm. going to interfere with my analysis as well. But he just seemed to at least on camera portray it as like, this is an experiment. I'm just going to watch the experiment and try to learn from it. And, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll give my conclusions. Yeah. I'm trying really hard in a lot of different ways to just not, this may sound a little Buddhist or something, but like not have attachments to ideas and not um, take things in a personal way and have my own opinion get in the way. I'm, I'm trying to be more of an observer, you know, and, and just kind of sit back and be like, well, that's, that's an interesting path that our species is now starting to take. I'm glad I'm not human. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, but, no, that, that's no, it's, it's not nihilism. It's and and yes, it is Buddhism. And it, yes, it is also a effective tool for science. Mm -hmm. Like Buddhism and science work together until you get into the, you know, the, all the mythology, but the, the underlying, you know, message of mindfulness and, and, and uh, attachment is completely compatible with science. Yeah. And, and for me, is completely been effective. It, and, and it also, it makes things even more special. Like most people think like, don't get attached to mom, don't love mom. It's like, <laughs> it's not that, you know, it, it's, it's not that at all. It's, it's knowing that, sh that you can't keep her here forever. Yeah. Mom's going to pass away. And don't your the human nature is to slip into some kind of denial, and that's only going to cause you more pain and suffering, mm -hmm. as Yoda would say, or somebody. So, uh, so yeah, <laughs> suffering it, it will cause, right? Suffering it will cause, but uh, no, it's and what it does is it makes your time with her even more precious, and you savor every single moment. It's about being in the now, and we can go on and on and on and on about this, but again, that what you said is very. It, 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 it rides right along with taking an mm. experiment. I, I mean, I remember I work, I, I collaborate with a, a atmospheric scientist at a university of Wisconsin. His name is Dr. Lee Orff. And he came up with some, uh, some theories and it, and his theories, one of his theories really made sense. And I really got attached to this theory. And then he did some more research and found out that it, it was still that, but it kind of wasn't exactly that. And I went, oh, man. And he just backhanded me. He took his, he just took, it just blackened my, I'm just kidding. He, he <laughs> let me know you can't be like that. Like, mm -hmm. that's not what scientists do. You, you can't get attached because it's you know, ultimately, what did Carl Sagan, how did Carl Sagan word it? Um, where there is strong emotion, you're liable to be wrong. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you let your health self have strong emotion, and if you're not aware of the strong emotion, especially, you're going to come up with all the wrong analysis. So you have to let go and make a commitment to follow truth yeah. and op wherever it leads you, no matter where it goes. And that's the big division, I think, if you boil it down, is are you a truth seeker or are you a comfort seeker? And that's where the big split that I see is happening. Yeah, no, I, I like I like that. I like the way you put that. I also have been really big, um, and this has helped me out in a lot of mental health ways and whatnot, but understanding that you are not your thoughts, you are not your opinions, um, 
because I think it's just becomes such an identity thing. Like I think this because I am this person, or maybe I'm aligned with this group or whatever. And, um, and just, just kind of separating the me from the I, I guess maybe is a way of putting it, but like the, the thoughts that you have, they kind of flow through you. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are things I would never say out loud, you know, but they pop in. Um, but just understanding that like, there's all these like sort of semi-conscious modules operating inside your brain. And I always, I always call them the gnomes in my brain. <laughs> I've got all these different gnomes in my brain that are like saying different things. And, and it's, it's up to me to decide which ones to listen to or test if that's the right way to go. But, um, but it's just like, just detaching yourself from your emotions and your thoughts and, what you want to be true and your opinions and just understanding that like you, you're not bound to that you can you can you can step outside of that it's so weird to talk myself now <laughs> no 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 not at all it's so weird for me to talk to somebody who's you know enlightened to this oh, i don't know that i would say that <laughs> no i'm serious that the, the fact that what you just said is is such a rare thing to hear on this side of the of the ocean it's just such a strange thing and it, yeah you're right it's it's people think they are their thoughts they don't realize mm -hmm. that it's human nature to be jealous and if you mm -hmm. under if you and this is really difficult to do what you just described takes practice and it takes a lot of understanding and a lot of reflection and a lot of critical thinking so and i'm not saying i'm good you, at it either it's just that right I, it's right that i do it's kind not of about but. right but that's the first start is understanding yeah. it and so what what you describe is yeah it's like you're no human is is going to be free of i mean very few there might be some sociopaths are going to be free of jealousy <laughs> you know so once you understand that jealousy is a natural human emotion that everybody has then with your tools of mindfulness, you can just observe that jealousy come and, and, and go, that's just that jealousy gnome. And then you can just, <laughs> and not go, why am I like, it's me. And yeah. not attach to that. And the same thing with these, these crazy, evil, horrendous thoughts that come into your mind. Everybody has, them. we yeah. don't talk about them. You know, and, and, I, and, you know, I'm thinking, I bet yours aren't nearly as bad as mine. And you're thinking, oh, I bet yours aren't nearly as bad as, mine. <laughs> as twisted as mine. Yeah. But then now you can, you can take that and you could either go, oh my God, that's me. Like I'm an evil, evil person. Or you can say, no, it's just that stupid thought that, right. and then just let it go. is just that it's just a thought. Yeah. 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 Thoughts that's huge. Purchase. That's huge. Sam Harris goes on and on and on. He's, he words this. Neil deGrasse and Sam are like, have done such a great way of communicating. It almost makes me feel like, why even try? I mean, those, these guys, <laughs> if, if they can't do it, how, um, how are you and I going to do it? Yeah, I, I get that. I get that feeling. It's kind of, it's kind of defeatist. You, you, like, um, I just always am like, um, I am not a scientist. I'm not a, a studied i mean i'm a filmmaker who studied who stumbled into science communication but i feel like if i have a strength that's what it is because i i'm still learning along with everybody else and and uh i can maybe if i can get myself to understand something then i can convey that to other people because i'm an idiot you know i'm i'm, I'm on the same level that they are um at least i think so yeah i i it's it's yeah you are i'm just kidding no i mean yeah uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree a hundred percent. It's, it's, I'm not a scientist either. And I don't want to be a scientist because all the scientists that I know are doing math all day long, every single day. Mm. I want to go out there and, and, you know, and give them stuff that they can use for their science, you know, that, yeah. it, you know, so, uh, but even though you're not a scientist, there's probably scientists unquote out there that aren't nearly as scientifically minded as you are. So oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it's kind of like, like, you know, I, I play basketball, you know, I can dribble, I can, I can block a shot. I'm a terrible shooter, but me and Michael Jordan aren't basketball players. You know, I'm we're not in the same boat together. Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, so, uh, and there, and there might be a guy out there who's, you know, a hundred times better than me that isn't in the NBA. So he, he's like, so yeah, there's all those nuances. That was a boring, boring answer. But uh, the point <laughs> of that, I was really trying to drive home to, to you and to people and to myself is that just being scientifically uh, aware 
and, and, and to have science, you know, thinking, you know, the scientific method methodically, we can uh, really improve our life and we can hopefully uh, decrease suffering in some amount by doing that. And, uh, and that think that's the ultimate goal is just to somehow reduce suffering, right? One way or another. Yeah. One way or another. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good place to end right there. I usually keep these to about an hour, but like, you just, you just queued up. Like, I was like, I, I can't top that. I don't know where else to go from there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. It, it sounds like we're just kind of both, you know, figuring this out together, you know, and, and, yeah, and, well, Live on the on the on the binary code. <laughs> I almost said tape, and I had to think of something else to say. Live on tape. Yeah. Uh, well, cool, man. Anything else? Uh, anything? Anything going on? Anything going on in your channel, or or any shows you want to promote, or anything? No. Nothing. Now's your chance. <laughs> no, I'm just doing I, I've the got, same I've got thing. like a thousand people that listen to this podcast. So yeah, no, I'm just doing the same thing. I'm just uh trying to create fun, educational, beautiful nature videos. And 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 hopefully I can go out and, and harvest more footage to continue doing that this year. You never know. You never know if you're gonna get anything at all. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it seems all, it seems wild to me. Um, but I, like I said, I stumbled on your channel and became a fan instantly. Part of it is because you got great footage, but it's also, you just, you just seem like a, a good soul. And, uh, I, I was like, I, I want to talk to this guy. So I'm glad. Well, thank I'm glad you so much. Talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that, that I wish you would have popped up in my feed. Um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, watching more of your videos they're really well produced and straightforward oh, and and you also have that voice you know that do works I, really well voice? you've got the voice yeah <laughs> i always think so, i sound like kermit now you, you you don't have the face but you've got them <laughs> <laughs> i got the face for radio <laughs> right 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 yeah i i get comments all the time from people that are like i i, I binge watch your videos and it puts me to sleep and i get that too yeah i could see that on yours because you, you definitely have like a very calming kind of voice um, I, 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 I see that in two different ways. One is, um, I don't, I don't really take offense to it. I could playfully be like, but I'm just kidding. Um, one is it's, there's a weird level of intimacy there. If, if you're literally falling to sleep, listening to my voice, it's, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm there with you as you're dozing off and in your most like vulnerable intimate moment Ooh. and i don't know how to feel about that dream of me <laughs> you must I, I i well me being a you know in a rock band i would say dream of me tonight <laughs> in your asmr voice yeah yeah uh but i don't i don't get offended when people say that i i, I think um it's probably a reflection of how I try to keep my videos lighthearted and people kind of want something to take their mind off of their troubles as they're, you know, going to bed and stuff. So that's how I see it. I have a bunch of thoughts on that. Okay. Right. We end, while we end in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can just stop editing it now, I guess. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, my thought, I had the same thing. Like people are like, I fall asleep to your videos and I get that a lot. And I thought, is that bad? Do I need to correct that? And then I realized I fall asleep to the videos of the guys that I love. And I definitely don't want to go to bed with somebody who's going, sale, sale, sale tonight, right now. Come get our, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't want, I'm not going to watch those guys. So, so Smash that means the like we're... button, buy my merch. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that's a good thing. I do too. A little weird, but it's a good thing. I'm sure they fall asleep to Neil deGrasse and David Attenborough as well. Oh, definitely David Attenborough. Kind of want to go watch some of that right now. I'm going to go watch you. Is this Neil deGrasse and you? Is this a podcast or a video or both? Uh, that's the podcast. So yeah, Sweet. the podcast is brand new. I just kind of started it in October. Um, and I'm trying to not put it all on YouTube. I'm trying to, you know, branch off of that platform a little bit. Uh, so I'm trying to make it stand on its own, but yeah, it's, it's just on the, any, any podcast player research conversations with Joe, that's what it is. It comes up. 
but that was actually the last one. It came out just around Christmas. Yeah, well, maybe I can have you on one of my things and we can have you talk to maybe my patrons or something like that. I don't have a podcast, but I do mm-hmm. want to do something special for patrons where I have all these scientists that I work with make appearances and talk and, and, and direct them, you know, to your channel. So I've got this, this uh, group of just science loving, you know, people. And uh, so who knows, maybe that would be something for a podcast down the road as well. If I ever go that route, hit me up. Sorry. That's where I want to go with this is I want to backlog all of these interviews. And then if I get enough of them, maybe, and if, if I can do it well, maybe start have some kind of podcast, Mm. you know, available. I've, I've interviewed people here and there for the channel. And from time to time, I would put it up as a podcast kind of thing. Um, it just kind of became formalized recently as, as sort of just a, another thing that wouldn't take up too much of my time. And, you know, it wouldn't be, it's just sitting down and having conversations with interesting people. And a big part of it for me, and this is exactly why I reached out to you is like, now that I've got a little bit of clout, it's kind of a gross word, but you know, now that the channel's at a certain size, it's like, I can, I can reach out to people and have a really good chance of, of talking to them. And, and sometimes it's more famous people. And sometimes it's people that I just find. And I'm like, that guy seems cool. I want to talk to him, you know, and Isn't that trying crazy? to like mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Like that's, that's the advantage of this weird, fortunate place that we found us. You know, I think you're, you're at like one point, what, 2 million views. I mean, subscribers, something 1. like that. Three, four. I think well, yeah. yeah. So but you're, I'm, you're coming up on a million. Yeah. I'm closing in on a million and I feel like, I'm excited for that only for clout or leverage to hang out with cooler people, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, yeah. and it, and it's starting to work. Like there was a, um, there's a guy in Thailand who, who wrangles cobras and I've been going to Thailand every year to find cobras. And I just am striking out. Can't, I mean, I'm finding everything, pythons, vipers. And I'm like, I'm going to reach out to this guy and, and they answer you right away. You know, Hey, uh, you know, which, yeah. you know, let's see how many, oh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's talk. So that, that I'm, I'm excited to, for more of that. You chase tornadoes and you, you hunt cobras. Well, I've been Dude. hunting them, but haven't found any. Yeah. Live dangerously. Yeah. Right. But I don't, I won't ride motorcycles just because even I, I have an urge to, to ride wheelies at 120 miles an hour at four. And just for that alone, it's like, don't get on a motorcycle. You've already pushed the envelope. You enough. got that. You got that call of the void. That's what I'm talking about. Is that what it is? I need you to help me dissect. Why is it that I think it's um, <laughs> I, I, my analysis of was I think I'm invulnerable because I've escaped death so many times. Hmm. And, and I know that that's dumb, but I don't fear it like the average person. Because you've been exposed to it or, or got had close calls. Yeah. His famous last words, right? I think I'm the opposite, actually, because I haven't really had any like, knock on wood, uh, any uh, life threatening illnesses or anything. And uh, so because of that, I I just don't handle the concept of death very well (laughs) because I haven't I haven't been acclimated to it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm almost acclimated to I might die right now. Mm. Yeah, your face just turns white, like you know. And the later, later you go back and look at the video and watch your face just go white. And there's this expression where like every muscle in your face says fear, and it's just I'm I'm any, you're just waiting for your car to just go flying. Like any now is is it now is it is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? And you're just Are you like, talking about when you're doing tornado stuff. Yeah. Okay. Like here we go. Here we go. It's like I'm going to die. I might, I may die right now. Just focus. Don't, you know, hold your ground, focus, 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 focus. And uh, yeah. How are we just now getting to that? Right. <laughs> that's, that's, wow. That's insane. You are what you do. You do what you are. Yeah. Mine was, you know, for better or worse. Yeah. All that. All that, people. Um, well, dude, I appreciate this. This was, this was fun. Yeah. Thanks a lot for reaching out, Joe. And I look forward to checking out your stuff right now. And uh, if you ever make it up to Dallas, maybe we'll go grab a drink or something. We got to. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Let me watch a few more of your videos and make sure you're not a hatchet murderer. And uh, and then we'll do that. Okay. We'll skip the one where I murder someone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. It's been, it's been a lot of fun.
Big thanks to Pecos Hank for hanging out with me and sharing his time and experiences doing this nutty thing that he does. Nutty, but important. Like, honestly, I, I really didn't even think about the fact that, you know, by doing this, he runs across scenes of devastation and, and, and people whose lives have just been turned upside down, quite literally sometimes. I was just thinking about the science of it and the art of the, the photography and everything. But of course, you know, he, he runs across people in their worst day of their lives and helps and comforts them. You know, that, that, that's got to take an emotional toll and require deep reserves of compassion and empathy. It takes a special kind of person to do that. So I applaud him on many levels for doing what he does. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, I invite you to take a look at the video on tornadoes that I did on, uh, well, it came, came out on Valentine's Day because because I know how to time things really well. Uh, but no, I, I use some clips from this interview in that video. Also, I use a lot of uh, Hank's footage in there as well. And, and of course, go check out his channel. It's Pecos Hank on YouTube. I'm sure you'll be as hooked on it as I was. This podcast was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. Intro music was submitted by Lemuel Spears Suzuk. <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying that right, but thanks, Lemuel, for submitting that. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me at all the places online at Answers with Joe and obviously on YouTube. Uh, thanks for listening. Please do spread the word about this because this we're still in the early days of this podcast. We can use all the help we can get. Feedback is always welcome as well. So, all right. Thanks again. You guys go out there and now and start some conversations of your own. Have a good one.